for communities across New York State. Hey, now let's take a moment so we all can figure it out what it's all about. It's the homework hotline, the homework hotline, the homework hotline, the homework hotline. And welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Joe Zaniga. And I'm Sam Simpson. Homework Hotline is the place where you get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. Now, for more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games and other online resources and the latest episodes of our show. All right, now a little later in the show, we'll see what Tim Cauley from the Rochester Museum and the Science Center has for us. But today is Thursday, and that means it's our science challenge. What do you have for us today, Jeff? All right, Sam, so I've got a glass of water here. Okay. I've got to have another water. It's just, it's just plain water. I haven't added okay. any to it. And I've got a couple ice cubes here that I may mm -hmm. add to our water. All right. Just trying to keep them in there, melting a little nice bit even cold. from being yeah. in the cooler, you know? So I'm going to add a couple. Yeah, maybe add one more. All right, and then I'm going to fill that right up to the very top. See how steady my pouring is. That's pretty close. All right, so we're right at the very top now. So can't shake right. the table. Yeah, okay. that's right. We got to be careful not to <laughs> shake the table. So if you can see those ice cubes there, actually, I'm going to put even a little bit more water in there. See those ice cubes, cubes there floating there? Yeah, yeah, all right. All right. And we can see they, they kind of stick out of the water a little bit. Yes, you know, they do. So, so when that ice melts, we would think maybe it's going to overflow. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's not. Okay. Okay. And we'll see that probably by the end of the show. Most of that ice will probably be melted. And that's going to be our science challenge to, for tonight. So the science challenge is why won't this water overflow when those ice cubes melt? And we'll be able to see that at the end of the show. Okay. Again, our science challenge for tonight is, why didn't the water overflow when the ice cubes melted? Hmm. If you think you can solve the science challenge, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly and you can have a chance to share that answer at the end of the show. But remember, every correct response we had our Hotline Hall of Fame earned enough points and you could win one of those tablets at the end of the season. Throughout February, we will be celebrating Black History Month here on Homework Hotline. This week, we've been taking a look at the Harlem Renaissance. And tonight, we're going to take a look at what caused the end of the Harlem Renaissance. Hmm. Let's come over to the board and let's take a look. Let's see if we can uh, talk about that for a minute. Well, the Harlem Renaissance ended in the 1930s. I didn't put a particular date on it, but it ended in the 30s. But what I want to convince you is um, that the numbers, it wasn't about population at all. Yesterday, I talked a little bit about the population growth of Harlem. I'm going to continue that a little bit so you get a real good understanding about the population and uh, growth in Harlem. So yesterday, uh, we talked about in the 1910s all the way up to 1920, there was only 43,000 people in Harlem. But by the end of the 1930s, there was 349,000 people in Harlem. But what I added to this uh, chart from yesterday is, I just wanted to show you in the 1940s, the population continued to grow. Between the, from the 30s to the 40, it grew by another 37%, or by almost looks to be about almost 150, 75,000 people moved into Harlem. And even now, if you look at Harlem, the population continued to grow. It peaked in the 1950s where they had approximately 560,000 people in Harlem. And if you look at the growth rate from 1910 to the 1940s, the population in Harlem grew by almost a thousand percent. That's huge growth. So this ending of the Harlem Renaissance had nothing to do with population. The population in Harlem continued to grow well after the end of the Harlem Renaissance. So what caused the Harlem Renaissance to end? Well, the simple answer is the Great Depression. However, 
a lot of modern day historians and critics say, well, we don't really know when the Harlem Renaissance began, and we really don't know when it ended, and we really don't know the exact cause. Um, a lot of researchers have come up with their own theories and explanations. Uh, even Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he wrote a book, and he basically said it. It really, you know, it's, it was it was perspective of uh, white Americans. Uh, Harlem Renaissance didn't really end it. Their thinking about it is what caused it to kind of say it in. So everyone had a position or an opinion about what caused the Harlem Renaissance to end. However, there were really like four key things that caused the Harlem Renaissance to end. Um, the first one is the exodus of a lot of key characters. A lot of the people in arts, science, music, they went other places. Prohibition Act, what was that all about? That was when uh, they outlawed alcohol. There were a lot of, you've seen some of the movies, periods from that time, there were a lot of clubs in New York City and Harlem during that time. And people went to those clubs to get alcohol and drinks. There were civil unrest, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and finally the Great Depression. So those are the four main things that people talked about why the Harlem Renaissance ended. The first one, the exodus of key characters. Well, we know people like, from yesterday we saw a lot of the uh, artists that were living in uh, Harlem begin to go, move and go to other places. Some went to Europe, a lot went to Europe, and they went to other major cities. Um, writers, musicians, they started going back to where they came from. Prohibition. I mean, I, one of my favorite shows that I watched was The Cotton Club. And it was about a club in, uh, in Harlem that everybody went to. All the musicians of the era performed there. Everyone wanted to be seen there. And they had alcohol and it flowed. Everybody went there because it was a party. Well, when that was partly because Prohibition Act came and people couldn't get it and alcohol, and people got it there. However, that, that act was, pat, was, was rescinded, and people didn't have to go into Harlem to, to go to clubs. So they started, I guess, drinking wherever they were. Probably, in my opinion, one of the key causes was civilian unrest. And by that, I mean um, there was a, a young man who got caught shoplifting. And there were some allegations of police brutality. And, of course, people were upset. Um, approximately 10,000 people took to the street to protest. So there was, that led to rooting, rioting, vandalism. And there was already questions about uh, police br brutality. So a lot of people didn't want to go into Harlem anymore. Probably the biggest thing, though, is the Great Depression. Um, a lot of historians, you can see that um, um, they said that the Great Depression really was the significant thing that caused um, the end of the Harlem Renaissance. Because with the Great Depression, you know, Harlem isn't that far from Wall Street, and the stock market crashed, people lost their jobs, um, there was looting in the cities, people just didn't want to be in Harlem anymore. So those four factors are really what caused the Harlem Renaissance to end. It had nothing to do with population. Harlem continued to grow. There was civil unrest, the Great Depression. Folks left. Those are some of the reasons why the Harlem Renaissance ended. King Philip came over for great spaghetti is a silly way to remember the classification of animals and plants in science. The classification order is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And now we'd like to welcome Tim Crawley from the Rochester Museum and Science Center. What do you have for us tonight? Hey guys, good to see Hi you again. Tim, how are nice you? to see you, Joe. And what we've got tonight, it's all about pressure. 
And we all know about pressure. There's pressure all over. And actually, one of the big things, we've got the balloon. Mm -hmm. Now, I blew up the balloon. Why doesn't it get any bigger? Because of the air pressure okay. around it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That holds it, keeps it from going. I put more air in, it gets bigger. But there's pressure around there. Easy way to prove it. There you go. <laughs> it took off. Just let it go. So there was more pressure in so, that balloon than outside it. And, that's, <laughs> and then once it got compressed, it threw out. So in pressure being, big formula for pressure is force over area. Okay. Or force divided by area. Okay. A great way to try it is take your hand, put it on your thigh. Push it about, oh, half as hard as you can. You go, uh -huh. all right, the force is how hard you're pushing it, because force is either a push or a pull, mm -hmm. and the area is your hand. So you can feel that. Yep. Now just take a one finger and put it against there, and push at about the same pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now, which do you notice more? The, the finger. finger. Yeah, that's cool. because you've got more pressure, you've got more force in a smaller area, cool. and that's how it works. Yeah. But today cool. what we're going to work on right. is we're going to work with air pressure. All right. And that is, right now I've got these cans. If we uh, let me make sure that they're up as high as they're going to go. Yep. Mm -hmm. If we take a look at it, we can see the steam coming up from the, coming uh, mm -hmm. from the top of the can. What's yep. happening now, I've got a little water in there. Then had it on the boil here for a little bit. Okay. So the air that's inside of that can is now being forced out, and it's being filled up with this steam. Because okay. you can actually. see the water vapor. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. the water vapor. Yeah. Exactly. So it's all in there. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see if I can put on... A, it's putting on the gloves. Here. I see putting that. on the gloves just in case. <laughs> All right. Because you never know. Now, if we do this quick enough, we'll be able to I've see how it works. Man. Let's see. We'll turn around. All right. Whoa. Hey. And you didn't squeeze that. I didn't squeeze no. it. That's right. We got to point that out. And it wow. crushed. The cool part, too, was that had probably half a can full of water in it. Exactly. And cool. it only started out with a little bit of water. Cool. Mm -hmm. So cool. what happens when the can compresses, it turns into a vacuum. Okay. And it starts to draw the water out of the, the bowl here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. into the can. So, so it really works pretty well. Let's talk about why it compresses. Now, you, yeah. I don't want to get ahead of you. No, no, do it. But you're, uh, you're boiling that. So we started, you talked about the water in there that's vapor. Mm -hmm. Now, when you cool that, by putting it into the water, that water turned back to a, that vapor turned back to a liquid, which took a lot less area, oh, or a lot less pressure. volume, and that's where the and that's the, where the pressure, the pressure from the outside came from. Cool. Pressure. The cool part is we've got another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Last time I was here, you jumped in, so we'll let you do this one. <laughs> all right, all right. And it's a piece of cake. All you want to do is you want to grab it with either hand. Grab the top, then grab the bottom with the other hand, and then put it right into the water. Really quick, huh? Mm -hmm. Really quick, somewhat quick. Grab it and put it in. Gra grab it with Do I the pour the water out or just push it in? No, no, no. You, you grab the top of the can, you hold on to the bottom of the can, yeah. and you just put it right into put it right into the water. All right. So that it the, the Ready. top of the can goes yep. in underneath Go. the water. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. And I didn't hurt myself or anything. No, no, no. <laughs> well, you know, you can't have it's everything. It's all the science, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I, well, we've got insurance for that. Don't worry. And the thing of it is, is it's a really cool demo to show kids that air pressure, it's all around you. It's something that really makes a, a big difference with what's going on. Mm -hmm. And also, we talk about how much this water boils. When you go to higher altitude, the pressure is a little bit right, less, less right. so it takes less to actually boil the water. If okay. you ever notice, we talked about this before, yeah. if you ever mm -hmm. notice on packages, it'll have high altitude instructions. Right. 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 So it'll be a little bit less time mm -hmm. or a little bit lower temperature. Mm -hmm. yeah. It works out really well, pressure. And, and give you an idea how much that pressure is, you know, we, we all experience all the time, so we don't feel it, but for every square inch, so about the size of a poster stand, there's 14.7s, so almost 15 pounds of pressure is about what the normal air yeah. pressure is that yeah. we're experiencing all the time without ever realizing it. You and know? where else do you find pressure when you go underneath the ocean? Well, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Every 32 feet is another. Every is 33 another feet is another atmosphere. 33 is another atmosphere. Yep. That's why scuba divers should never run out of air pressure. Mm -hmm. Right. Because right. they go underneath, they have to only go up 33 more feet, and the pressure doubles. Now, you know what you were saying earlier. As a scuba diver, you can't fly for 24 hours after your last dive. 
because when you're under that pressure, you more of the nitrogen is off your the blood. Nitrogen. Yeah. And wow. the same bends you could get if you come wow. up too quickly. You talk about uh, when you so. Yep. And you, you've probably all experienced air pressure when you what you say your ears pop sometimes right, when you go over right, a hill or right, in an elevator. Right. You know that's that change in air pressure. Our our uh, airs are extremely ex sensitive to change in pressure. Exactly. Very yeah. cool. All right. All right, Tim, guys. Thanks again. Thanks again. Great thanks job again. as thanks always. For me. Yep. All right. Now we want to thank Tim for being here. Now to learn more about the Rochester Museum and Science Center, head to our website homeworkhotline.org. And now we'll be right back in a few seconds. So stay right there. My very excellent mother just served us noodles. This mnemonic device or memory tool can help you remember the order of the planets in our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. All right, Sam, when you noticed our ice cubes have melted. Yes, they have. All right, so we'll come back to that. Okay. But I've got a little lesson. We've talked about uh, the Harlem and the Renaissance, and we talked a little bit about art. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do a little lesson on color. Cool. All right. So when we talk about color, a lot of things come up. Vision, I have the eye here. But kids that are taking some physics know that it has to do with light. And the wavelength of light is why we see those different colors. And that's all part of this electromagnetic spectrum. So I got a little picture of the sun there because the sun gives off that full amount. We're used to just detecting that small amount that's what we call the visible range. So if we look at this electromagnetic spectrum, so this will look familiar to kids taking earth science. This is right off the earth science reference tables. This is that full spectrum. And if we look at the left where the smallest wavelengths are, we see things like gamma rays and x-rays. Now those are very high energy rays. You know, x-rays have a medical um, use to, to uh, take pictures of our bones, but the problem with these two is they're so high energy, they can also cause damage to uh, their ionizing radiations. They can cause damage that could result in cancer. Then we see ultraviolet. Now, um, you may hear about ultraviolet because the strongest ultraviolets can also give you skin cancer, but ultraviolet also is what gives us um, our tans, part of that ultraviolet range. But then the small little band in here is the visible range. And no ultraviolet comes down to violet on the far end, if you know your, your rainbow is red, and red is followed by the infrared, that's the radiant heat we can feel. So if you're in front of a fire, you can feel the heat radiating off it or something very hot, that's the infrared. And then microwaves, which we use to cook, and radio waves, TV waves will be in there or at the other end. All right, so if we look at a wave, this is a typical wave, the way we describe it, the wavelength is the point from the same spot on one wave to the next. That's how, what the wavelength is. That we're gonna see is what determines what the color is of, uh, of, of the different uh, light that we're gonna look at. So, if we look at this, is the old Earth Science reference tables, the um, 2000, oh, what year this version was, when they actually had the, uh, the actual measurements on there. But notice this visible range goes from about 400 to about 700 nanometers and it's broken down to the colors of the rainbow, but this one actually breaks it down by different, the different actual wavelengths. Now that's more than we really need to get to, but it is gonna help to understand how we see color. Now, all of those colors together are what we consider white light, so it's a mixture of all those wavelengths. And probably you've all seen when you separate white light with a prism, we can separate into the different colors, the color of the rainbow, I've got a little rainbow here as an example of that, it happens from refraction from um, from the moisture in the air. And black, the color black, isn't really a color, but that's an absence of light. So what we see is something is black is no light is being reflected. So let's take it a step further. What do our artists do? We have our primary colors that you probably learned about, red, um, blue, yellow, and those can be mixed to get what we call our secondary colors, the green, the orange, the violet, and purple. So if I mix the blue and red, I'm gonna get my violet. The red and yellow, I'm gonna get my green. The red, excuse me, the red and yellow, I'm gonna get um, my green, um, or my orange, I'm sorry, I said the wrong one. My blue and yellow, I'll get the green, all right? But what's that have to do? Well, those are subtractives. As an artist, what happens is they mix different paints and pigments, and when they do that, those things absorb specific wavelengths because when we see something, the reason that we're seeing this blue uh, font here is because all the other wavelengths are being absorbed except for the blue. 
the blue is what's reflected back into your eye. So as an artist, they mix their pigments to make sure the color that they want to see is the one that's reflected, that all the others are absorbed. Now, what do we see? How do we see? This is the important thing is we see with our eyes, we always think about it, but really it's how it's interpreted in our brain that allows us to see the different colors. We have different kind of receptors in our eyes. We have rods, and those rods, remember I said they range about four to 700. They uh, peak at about uh, um, 500 nanometers, but they're what's responsible for our, our black and white vision. If you ever notice when it's not very bright out, you don't see colors, you can only see in black and white because the rods will work well even in low light. The cones are what are, gives us our color vision and they only work well in brighter lights. So when you're in, a, in your room at night and it's dim, you notice you don't see the colors. You can still see in black and white. And as humans, we have what we call trichromy because we actually see a different cellar, um, three different uh, areas. Most mammals only see two, birds see in four. But we and most of the primates see three different spots that we can absorb at. We have a long one that does the long wavelengths. We have a medium receptor that does the medium wavelengths and then a short, short receptor for the short wavelengths, all of us who aren't colorblind that is. We can talk about that if we have time. So they all overlap. What we have here is the long wavelengths that peak at about 600 nanometers. That's this one that sees the greens, the yellows, the oranges, and the reds. The medium one that peaks at about 550 can see the cyan, the greens, and the yellows, and the oranges. And then our short wavelength one is the violets, the blues, and the cyan. See how these three, and then the other ones, the, um, the rods. They kind of overlap each other because what our brain does then is it interprets the feedback from all these different receptors as the color we actually see. Let's we say we see with our eyes but without our brain, and actually there's some processing that's done by the nerves themselves on the way is what allows us to see all those different colors. You think of the metallic colors we can see and all the intermediate colors. It's because we're not just getting feedback from one of these, but notice anywhere where we're on the spectrum, our eye is gonna be getting feedback from many different receptors, as well as the rods for most of them. So when we look at this, now we're talking about additive colors. And you may see on your TVs, the RGBs, the, um, what we're looking at now is when we're adding different wavelengths together. Now before it was subtractive, what color you're gonna get. So if we add the red and the blue wavelengths together, we get that magenta. If we add the red and the green wavelengths together, our eyes are gonna sense yellow. And if we add the blue and the green, we get the cyan, and notice those are the three colors you see in your color TV for adjusting your TV. TVs are gonna be just the opposite of what the artists do. They're gonna add the wavelengths we want, whereas an artist is mixing pigments to take, a, pigments to take away what he want. And if we add the red, the green, the blue all together, we get the, we, our eyes will see that as white. Our brain will interpret that as white. So it's kind of interesting. We think of color, you gotta look at it two different ways. As an artist, you're taking a wave, 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 wavelengths and it's those ones that left are the ones that our eyes will send a message to our brain and we can interpret it. As our TV, you're working just the opposite. So hopefully this will give you a little idea what color is. It's kind of inter interesting to look at in more detail. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion with the same direction and speed unless interfered with. All right, Sam, we have a winner in the science challenge. Hello, Matthew. Hey. Hi, Matthew, what's going on here? How come that didn't overflow? And the ice cube see... is less dense than the water. Yes. So it actually has less volume when it's liquid than it has when it's solid. Exactly right. So Excellent. why do things float? They displace amount of water equal to what their mass is, right? That's correct. All right, and so that ice cube, well, liquid water has a, has a density of about one gram per cubic centimeter, and so like you said, the ice, ice was less dense. Now so that it's floated. melted, it's taking up a, a, a less area, and it's very similar to Tim's demonstration earlier, okay? It, it's, uh, if it went even, uh, when it melted out, it took less area, and we didn't get a spill there at all, did we? Yeah. All right. Yeah, and, and I would have thought that it would have been the opposite. It would have had more water. Ah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? You, you're not the only one that thinks that. But you know, that's, that's interesting because we talk about problems with global warming, climate change, mm -hmm. and you always hear about melting of the ice caps in the Antarctic and, and uh, Greenland, but you never hear them talking about the Arctic Ocean, but that actually is going to have no effect. You know, that, that whole ice 
cap is floating, and as it melts, it's not going to okay. really change. It's the big ones that are on land that's going to cause the problems. Mm. All right. Great Matthew, job. You, as always, Matthew, great job. You, you, uh, you got it again. Congratulations. But don't forget, now, every correct response goes in our Homer Colling Hall of Fame. Earn enough points, and you can win a tablet at the end of the season. That's all that we have time for tonight. Next week on Hotline, we'll be maxing and relaxing on February break. We'll be back on the 26th with new episodes. We want to see you then. Good Bye, night. guys. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSIC, working for communities across New York State.